Gosh. My name is Marsha. I'm a community pharmacist. I've been working for too many years to actually tell you here. And I would like to say, in the light of COVID, how very proud I am to be able to call myself community pharmacist. And that goes for all my community pharmacy colleagues and their healthcare teams who have really had to raise their game and worked so hard over the past few months. It's been incredibly challenging. And they've done a really, really, we have done a really amazing job. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, my other role is as a community pharmacy research champion. I shared that role with one of my LPC colleagues, Shivali, and we're looking to bring research into community pharmacy. Quite a few of you may have seen lots and lots of emails from me already um, saying that we're doing this research and that research. And I'm also very, very happy to be a support pharmacist at Middlesex Group of LPCs, um, helping to help our community pharmacists out there through this difficult time. So, can I please have the next slide? So, before I look towards the future, or the potential futures of services in community pharmacy, I wanted to go back a couple of years because I don't think we can look forward unless we have an idea of what's driving our, our services forward. So a couple of years ago, when I started at the LPC, um, I remember being asked by a consultant, what can community pharmacy bring to the table? Um, in the light of the National Review of Asthma Deaths, which has already been mentioned, um, we, we knew that there was an awful lot of work being done out there trying to help people with asthma but the figures still weren't great. And one of the findings, I'll just give you a statistic, um, or one of the, the comments was, children fared worse than adults in several respects and care fell well below that expected of the standards in almost half of the child deaths. So that was incredibly worrying. And then it said 86% with children and young people, um, the deaths were were due to avoidable factors, um, blah, blah, blah. And then it said, with routine medical care and monitoring. So that's really, really scary. So there was obviously a big push after that to start looking at ways that we could help everyone with asthma, everyone with respiratory problems, but particularly children and young people. So we at Middlesex Group of LPCs started to look at what was going on out there already. Um, different research studies, pilots. Um, I was very inspired by Bipin's Bexley model, and he probably doesn't remember me, um, hounding him with phone calls, asking lots and lots of questions, going back to 2018, to find out more about the service. And then we thought, well, there are these services out there, but why, still why are things not improving? So we called in Darush with his inhaler technique um, services. And on a very personal level, I wanted to know that if I've been an experienced pharmacist for so many years, was I actually doing my MUS, MURs and NMSs justice? Was I really helping my patients? So Darush came along to the office and we had a little training session, not a full training session, just a taste of check training session. And I have to say that I work part time, five hours a week, only in an evening. And over the following two weeks, I helped not four patients, but I would say four families, just five minutes with inhaler technique. I showed the parent how to help the child and that then helped the whole family because several of the members of the family also used asthma inhalers. So it just showed just a very short training on inhaler technique, how very, very important that was. So we set about organizing a series of interactive workshops through 2018, 2019. And Darush, if I could have the next slide, please. We reported back to the Ask About Asthma campaign in 2019 that those three workshops were unbelievably successful. We started with just 
maybe 16 people at our first one, just trying it out, see how it worked and gaining feedback. And on our last one, we had people turning up without actually registering because they were so keen to join the workshop. It got such a good reputation. And looking at the feedback a couple of months afterwards, we contacted several of the pharmacists again, and they said that what they'd got most out of the workshops wasn't necessarily the educational content, but it was the learning how to impart that knowledge, how to coach and how to start the conversation. They felt so much more confident. It didn't take long to show somebody how to use an inhaler technique or to coach someone, but they were much more confident in doing so. And the feedback as well from the patients, and I can say that from my own patients over the past couple of years, is that just something as simple as coaching inhaler technique has made a massive difference to their health outcome overall, and that actually of their families too. So last year, we decided to make a new pledge to the Ask About Asthma campaign and start developing sort of on the lines of the Bexley model, but to, to look at respiratory services generally, we wanted to develop some new types of review service, especially as we could see the demise of the NURs. We felt now wasn't the time to stop being paid for running a really important service. So, Darush, please. So, we're moving on to 2020, which is obviously now. We had hoped to report back that we'd set up this service specification, it had been commissioned, and we were evaluating and having fantastic outcomes. Everyone was feeling better, and overall quality of life had improved. But along came COVID. Darush, next slide, please. Um, obviously, everything came to a halt. The breaks went on. The DCGs couldn't actually commission anything at, at the time, and the LPCs really did have to turn their hand to supporting our community pharmacies. Uh, things were very, very difficult. So, Darush, please. So, I put here, can we find good in COVID? Because I like to think of life as half a glass half full. If any of you have seen my blog this week, we call it a glass half full. Not always is something that looks bad really terrible. And so trying to find some of the positives that have come out of, of COVID, um, it's already been touched on. But although people were panicking because of the lung effects of COVID, they were also starting to take responsibility of their own care. This is something we were seeing in community pharmacy. And there was a lot of discussion around good asthma control. People needed to be able to breathe properly and they didn't want to risk falling ill with COVID. So the surgeries were quick to respond. Darusha said they um, did their searches, contacted their patients. Um, there was a lot of panic, as we've mentioned, a lot of shortages. But another good that came out of this was that everybody collaborated. Community pharmacy, LPCs, the CCGs, consultants and drug companies as well to make sure that all the patients received the treatment that they really did need. And it worked very well for, for once we were all on the same page, which was really very good. So next slide, please. Um, so how did community pharmacy adapt? Um, from our own community pharmacy, it was difficult, without a doubt. We had to adapt extremely quickly uh, with very little support. We didn't really know what was going to be going on out there, but as community pharmacists, we always deal with what's in front of us. And it was obviously difficult that in the pharmacy, it's difficult to demonstrate or coach inhaler technique. But luckily, we do have apps, we do have literature, and we could educate the patient. Uh, some pharmacies were lucky enough to have video technology. Um, and those patients who have video technology, they could use that between them. Uh, unfortunately, the video technology that the pharmacist installed at that time was private, it wasn't funded by the NHS. Um, so not that many pharmacies had it, and um, 
Daru showed the slide briefly before, pharmacists who were familiar with some of the children's apps could refer to uh, the apps such as Kim Clark's Raffito. So next slide. So this is a little picture of the Raffitone, which is an interactive game. Um, it interacts with uh, a device on the chamber of a spacer, uh, the mask of a spacer. And as the child is using the spacer, it activates the game where Raffi, I don't know if you can see my cursor, Raffi obviously with the R, um, if he uses his inhaler properly, he can defeat the baddie. So presumably the dog bear, whatever it is on the side there. Next, uh, space, uh, next slide. And that's just another little picture of Rafi using his inhaler with the uh, chamber, uh, defeating, I don't know if he's a goodie or a baddie there, but he's, uh, he's using the inhaler properly. And it will encourage good technique and hopefully instill good technique at a very early age with the children. Bit of fun for them as well. Next slide. So remote consultations. Obviously the arrival of COVID-19 forced everybody to change. This is something the LPC have been talking about uh, earlier on this year, not just by way of inhaler techniques or respiratory care, but with long-term conditions generally. We've been to meetings and we're very aware that there are cohorts of patients who are difficult to engage. So remote consultations, video consultations was something we had been thinking about. And also if we look to the other end of the age scale, COPD patients often not coming out, not coming into the pharmacy, even pre-COVID, and then not getting their inhaler technique checked. So we did think if it was possible to help them at all using some sort of video technology, remote technology, that um, that would be a pathway we would look at. But now during COVID, it has forced the widespread spread use of the video platforms, and it's it has revolutionised interactions. We've all had to do it at the same time. If we'd have tried to get pockets of people or pockets of organisations to use video technology, it probably wouldn't have worked. But globally now, we've all had to adapt very, very quickly. Um, the NHS, as far as I know, provided the free technology to primary and secondary care. Uh, next slide, please, Darush. But while they became the norm for primary and secondary care, and I read an article saying that 99% of surgeries now are video enabled, community pharmacies were a little left behind and had to source and finance their own, unfortunately. So next slide, please. So what could the future look like with the community pharmacy? Well, enabling these remote con consultations could Darush has mentioned maybe some people don't have the technology, which is fair. Many do. It could extend the reach of healthcare to those who are harder to engage, um, and definitely now to those who are isolating or vulnerable. If the telephones in community pharmacy are anything to go by, our phones were ringing themselves literally off the hook with inquiries, people asking for advice. Um, a lot of it we did try to manage. But obviously, an inhaler technique, we can't do by phone. And we can't see the patient. Um, if it's anything else, it would be nice to be able to actually see the patient. I put on here latest news, which is really good news. The PSNC announced that from the 1st of September, we no longer need to have paper consent for our reviews. Um, just in time, obviously, for flu season. But that really helped us so much because they've now also said we can do the NURs and NMSs remotely. So that's now opened up a world of remote video consultations. Absolute common sense should have happened a long, long time ago, but at least it's forced the issue. And um, at least we're, we're sort of almost there now. The future is now catching up, thankfully. So next slide. 
So as far as video consultations, we have been talking to um, various companies over the past months, um, trying to fast track uh, some development. Um, there are a couple of big companies who I won't name. There are also a couple of smaller digital companies who are actually designing uh, community pharmacy platforms. Um, they have various functions, but they are there to suit the needs of individual businesses. Um, very innovative, very helpful. Hopefully, they will be designed to enable us to have certain video consultations. The We think that the Children and Young Person Asthma Review will probably be well placed as one of the first to try and get up and going in something like this with a specially designed review for video consultations. With the light of, of the video technology and what we think is potentially the future of consultations, um, the Middlesex group got together with the South Crack Academic Research Unit at Imperial College and one of these platform providers to look at the acceptability and feasibility of the platforms in community pharmacy. On the slide, I put that um, positive interim results. Well, this morning, we actually got the results in and I'm very happy to report that in a survey that we sent out to the general public, 91% of the public would like to be able to have a video consultation in community pharmacy, either to have some sort of review or to have advice and be able to purchase a product. So that was probably overwhelmingly better than we were expecting. We thought people, we asked all different age groups um, across the board, uh, all different communities, and we were expecting some to say, no, they weren't so keen, but actually it was incredibly positive. So next slide, please. So what did it look like for a community pharmacy children and young person asthma review? So remembering that most pharmacies have at least six annual patient prescription contacts for a patient with long-term conditions. So a child and young person with uh, an ICS as well as uh, a SABA, we may well see them six to 12 times a year or the parents. So it was mentioned before, making every contact count. Well, in community pharmacy, we have a lot of contacts and each one of those is an opportunity to make sure that a patient is using their inhalers properly or checking for red flag signs. Um, what could those reviews be like? We've discussed with respiratory leads, with consultants, with the CCG, we've taken a lot of advice. And one area that kept coming up was those patients who are not engaging with primary care for their annual asthma review. That was part of the MRAD recommendation, that all asthma patients should be offered an inhaler check or some sort of review annually, but a lot of people aren't going. So we thought maybe that would be an idea to have referral. So if the patient is not attending, a search can be done in primary care and maybe the patient of the reviewing community pharmacy and a referral sent across digitally. The community pharmacy can then do the review and send notes of the outcome digitally back to the GP practice. So closing a loop so that everybody has the same information. Another interesting one that came up for us, um, which was it, the ideas came through separately, one from a community asthma nurse and the other from a respiratory consultant. And they both commented that when patients are sent to them, particularly children and young people, when the patient is sent to them, um, requiring slightly more specialist treatment than can be given in, in general practice, they have three consultations. 
and then the patient is discharged back to general practice. But sometimes they don't feel that the patient is ready to go back to general practice. And then they thought, wouldn't it be a nice idea if they could discharge their patient into the care of their community pharmacist for monitoring when they collect their inhalers? So that's something else we're looking at at the moment. So next slide. So what can we do? Um, it's been mentioned before, inhaler technique checks. We also thought about maybe raising a review if a red flag sign is shown during the pharmacy quality points, the asthma quality points questioning, um, if, they, if the patient hasn't got a spacer, if the child doesn't have a spacer or an asthma plan, maybe that could lead into a commission review. So that's something we're looking at. And also, um, if we need to add in healthy lifestyle, smoking cessation, that could possibly lead into a review as well. So we're looking at all different areas that we can offer commissioned reviews, either face to face, not always practical at the moment, or by remote. So next slide, please. Um, we're also looking in a research capacity to to do some work with Clement Clark, known for their in-check dial and um, peak flow meters, um, lots of little gadgets and apps to help improve technique and um, an outcome. And just a little picture here of a clip tone which is used with a buddy trainer device, I think it's called, and this would be an interactive device. This is for an older child because they don't have a spacer, but um, the device will interact with the app and as they're inhaling the red marker will go up and the balloon will raise and it's just again a little bit of fun and it helps to coach them on good technique so we're in talks at the moment with Clement Clark to see if this is something that we can start a little research study to see if it's practical for community pharmacists to use apps like this maybe remotely with a review and see what the outcome is, if it really does help or if it's a little bit too cumbersome. So, so next slide, please. So what could the future look like for community pharmacy and children and young people with asthma? So just really overall, our thought process is, is that we, we need to have collaborative, integrated, commissioned children, young person asthma services. Um, something special, something properly designed and researched. We also need to be able to have the technology and the technology to give both the patient and the pharmacy choice to ensure the community pharmacy services remain I've put here accessible to the whole community. Community pharmacy has always been the most accessible healthcare provider on the high street and we're in absolutely no doubt now in COVID times when many of the primary care services are closed to the public. Um, that community pharmacy is still there and should have a choice of how to carry out its reviews and to enable the patient to have the choice as well of how they want to access those services. And obviously, with my research hat, I would really like to see community pharmacy is being motivated and enjoy working together with us to bring in some research on how to to move these services forward so that's it from me thank you very much and i'll hand you back to raj thank you marcia um, very very informative once again okay so we have uh, to my, to my poor chairmanship that come to the end but i am going to open it up for q and a's or discussion points uh, Sarah Jane raised a very interesting observation in that as we sort of march into this uh, technology-based uh, nirvana, we are going to leave people behind who haven't got access to technology. So how are we actually going to uh, address those inequalities? Um, I was just wondering if colleagues have any sort of uh, thoughts on that. You want me to stop share there? Yeah. Thank you, Rish. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's a challenge, and we're going to have to use a bit of, um, you know, old-fashioned postal services at times. You know, posting questionnaires out, um, 
uh, I'm, I'm finding uh, at times uh, the asthma control test questionnaire. Um, it's not very often, but sometimes we, we do need to do things like that. Mm. Uh, I do find telephone is 99.9% .9 available, you know, from, from with patients. And uh, if a person is able to get in front of a computer and you can talk through over the phone, um, you know, after maybe sending a link or something along those lines to a website, you can talk through things. I'm finding that's my way around. If I can't get video um, use, I can just talk through sites and say, um, like, for example, reassurance around inhaled corticosteroid strength. I had a patient saying, isn't my um, medicine too strong? And I basically got them to click on the Right Breathe website and um, said, click on your inhaler and you'll see a green traffic light signal that shows you that um, it's not that strong. And if you use this regularly, it'll keep your symptoms at control, you know. So um, you just have to adapt. And then in some situations, um, I know I've been speaking to community pharmacy colleagues who are saying that they're, um, you know, still doing face to face, but obviously um, as much as um, as safe as they possibly can. So yeah, it's, I, I still do face to face. I had a couple uh, other weekend. You just have to make sure that they're standing on one end of the consultation room and you're at the other end, uh, and uh, you know decon decontaminate after they've left. So it, it is a challenge at the moment out there in community pharmacy, but I think we will be able to do that. Um, how can we make spaces available more easily? I mean, uh, is there something that we could do? I know the RPS was tweeting today that pharmacists should be able to change prescriptions during COVID. Surely in this day and age, we should be allowed to actually give out spaces when there, there is a school of thought. I think that every inhaler should come with a free spacer, but uh, I'm not sure my CCG colleagues would be too <laughs> happy with that. But, you know, there, there should be a way. I mean, as Marsha was talking earlier about monitoring these patients, that perhaps one of the ways we can actually encourage that is to provide them with a free spacer when they get, when they actually start with, with us. Yeah, I mean, one spacer should last um, at least six months, but it can actually go around 12 months. And then as long as the patient is um, following their cleaning instructions, uh, which is normally from BTS sign, they say monthly, and there's a specific way of cleaning it. Um, yeah, I think if people can keep to that, then uh, one spacer is not going to cost an arm and a leg, and it can be prescribed. But uh, if it can be issued out in the pharmacy, that's great too. That's certainly something we would like to see as, a, as part of a, a proper respiratory service. Would be to have that. And a peak flow meter would be rather nice as well. I've seen those coming forward very often nowadays. Yeah. Okay, this is probably a tough question for the community pharmacist in the, uh, in, the in the chat. Uh, how do we reduce the variation in the care provided across community pharmacy? That's uh, that's a fairly hefty challenge. So uh, I'm asking the community pharmacist. I mean, I've got ideas. I mean, a few years back ago, we wanted to introduce a uh, accreditation program. Uh, where you have to maintain certain standards to be able to provide a service. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to the challenge and uh, open to any suggestions. I certainly am, am on the same wavelength as you, Raj, with that, because that is something I would like to see as a being an experienced, what I thought I was an experienced pharmacist for very many years and wondering where I was going wrong. And I probably hate to admit that I was probably one of the 90% who wasn't showing inhaler technique properly until we had our mini taste session. Mm. Um, and that's why I was so passionate about rolling out the programs and, and trying to get people in for training. And I do think we need to keep that training going and having regular accreditation. There, I think there are just a few um, topics where we need to keep revisiting and keep refreshing and I think that's one of them to maintain standards. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you there I think but it's it's, it's an ongoing uh, task that, that has to be handled by I, I suppose the LPCs uh, but I think it does need collaboration with our commissioners as well and I've got questions about how we can expand or even repeat the Bexley pilot 
um, perhaps uh, we need to be working with our colleagues in commissioning, uh, especially across uh, primary care networks. Pippin, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I do think that um, what Marshall said does make sense, but also I think having, this is possibly a case where we need to have specialist pharmacists and now with the, with the advent of uh, primary care networks, there should be a um, facility for us to signpost patients, our patients, to specialist pharmacies within the network. So as much as we all need to have some baseline information, I think some of us can specialise in certain fields and, and other colleagues will signpost their patients to get um, long-term care. And that is a solution I think that can work. Um, a lot of these things can only work if a patient is registered that's registered in a way that they use the same pharmacy. And I know nominations of prescription or nominating a preferred pharmacy is a route. But I think also getting the understanding from the patient that they will be using this pharmacy to get continued care. And I think it, it's it's a step process, but something along those lines is something where I can see a, a solution to what, um, what you've raised, Raj. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point because when we were doing the IPMO project, when we were doing specifically in hypertension, we came up with a cohort of patients that would be managed in community pharmacy and a cohort of patients that would be managed by the practice pharmacy and those complex patients would be managed by the consultant pharmacy in acute, in acute trust. And even the asthma uh, uh, slide I had there with Gronio, who was the consultant pharmacist who came down to sort of train us as well. So there is that opening up of our profession and breaking down of barriers between sort of community pharmacy, practice pharmacists, and even consultant pharmacists in acute trust. And I think that's to be encouraged. And the more interaction that you have, you'll find that you will bring up the expertise across the whole patch. I'm just looking for any more hands that uh, people want to want to ask any questions. I know we're slightly over time and you can blame me for my bad chairmanship. <laughs> me for my chatting. <laughs> I think uh, one thing when I was watching um, um, Marsha's presentation with the spaces, I think um, one thing we've got to be aware of is keeping um, that messaging simple because um, the aero chamber makes a noise if you inhale too quickly. The uh, Clement Clark one you're showing with the mask and if the mask makes a noise, it, it, it communicates with the app. And in that instance, it's good. And the last thing we want to do is confuse our colleagues to say, um, anytime you hear a, a noise from a spacer, for that one it's okay and that one it isn't. Um, so we've got to be very, very careful. And the cleaning of spacers, um, we, the, because the mask is not anti-static, children above the age of four or five, what you're finding is if they're still giving that mask with the spacer, it gets so filthy it's so important that they don't actually need the, if they don't need the mask we don't give them the mask anymore and they just use the mouthpiece and then keep that obviously clean as well so that's a common problem we see so there's so much um as you say re-education and training that needs to take place yeah. yeah i think we need both to be fair i think rare accreditation but leasing as a pcn community pharmacists together with their pcn i think is the way to go as well. We could have a two strand perhaps. So for opportunistic checks, small checks, small interventions, but if somebody needs something slightly more complex, we can hand them over to, to someone who has special interest. Mm, I agree, I agree. So yeah. I've got, uh, sorry, sorry, Marcia, to interrupt. I've got a couple of hands up. I've got Britpol followed by Bola. So Britpol first. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Very brilliant uh, uh, evening. Uh, been uh, really keen and interested in uh, reviewing this. I think, uh, you know, um, what we need is we need a sort of a very basic uh, uh, sort of training. You know, uh, Vipin, when we did the training in uh, um, Bexley, you know, something as uh, uh, simple as that, but Marsha and, uh, you know, uh, Zerush could uh, have a look at it, you know, and see whether we could just come up with a London-wide basic training that we give to pharmacists and um, get them to just review it, give them uh, some sort of uh, incentive. I don't know, from your LPC point of view, I think we need to encourage them to, to um, you know, 
maybe personal time or whatever, but I think we need a basic training session with a, a quiz at the end of it and some sort of, you know, lovely certificate, probably multicolored so that they, they feel <laughs> proud, you know. <laughs> we can take this conversation up uh, later and see if we can come up with a training plan. Okay. Yeah, I think something simple that's yeah. London wide and then, um, then, then I think then, you know, you, you can go and get it, get it commissioned. Yeah. Okay, Bola, you had your hand up? Yes, I do. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's an excellent evening with lots and lots of good work. Um, I think I raised a number of um, challenges in the chat. But I just wanted to reiterate that sort of some of the points that the last speaker raised um, around working, um, I suppose, as one across London. There are too many variations. I mean, over the years, um, community pharmacists have developed expertise in various areas only to have the services decommissioned. Um, so there is a lot of expertise out there, but again, it's if the service is not there, then pharmacists cannot deliver such um, care at scale. So you'd have pharmacists who are providing, I suppose, providing excellent care to their patients, but sort of in little pockets across London. Um, so my question is, how do we address that across London? Well, I think that's a, that's a fairly tough challenge, and you, uh, I'm, I'm not—I don't know whether you're aware of the Wright Review, which is a review by Professor Wright that's been conducted at the moment into our body, um, the PSNC and the LPCs, that's looking at whether the structures moving forward are there for commissioning. And in that, he quite clearly said that uh, pharmacists should only engage in services that actually are sustainable and profitable. Um, so it, it's, it's a very tough challenge for commissioners and providers to work together. And I think it has got to be a case of co-production. And one of the successes of co-production has been the London Flu Vaccination Service, which started a few years ago and then became the National uh, Service. So it's, it's, it needs a willing commissioner and willing providers and when you get two of those together, I think you will be able to address uh, that particular challenge completely. Now, I may not be able to pronounce his name right, but do please forgive me. Is it Makaya? I said that right? Because it's Sakeshi. Hi. Hi, I'm Sakeshi. I, I, I work as a specialist pharmacist actually in respiratory, uh, paediatric respiratory medicine. And I think, you know, it would be really good if we could collaborate across primary, secondary and tertiary care, largely because one of the issues we have in hospital is actually adherence checks. Because one of the things we can do is we can look at what prescriptions um, are issued by GPs by looking at their GP records. But one of the, the, the most critical points we miss is what they actually co collect. And actually, you know, I, I'd like to explore your thoughts on this because it's such a big issue for us in hospital. I know, I know. Um, I was sitting at one of the Armok meetings and I think it was Professor Wiseman that was sitting next to me presenting on adherence. And as a result of that, uh, we're going to be working in DBG with a few pharmacists and uh, King's partners looking at an, an adherence service, just checking why patients, including respiratory drugs, why they're not taking their drugs as, as they should do. So that's a challenge we'll hopefully be addressing uh, in October time when the training starts and, and hopefully I'll be able to report that back to you. But it is interesting uh, that the adherence challenge is big, as I mentioned earlier, 30 to 50 percent of medicines are used inappropriately. So there's something quite not right and perhaps even the way community pharmacies commissions uh, in terms of supply of medicines needs to be reviewed and uh, move over to a more uh, clinical service where we're actually monitoring the patients as, as was alluded earlier and looking at those acute patients that are walking for, uh, into our pharmacies asking for medicine. So it, it's, it's something that we need to look and review. Uh, Mike Keane. Can I just... Sorry. Oh, off you go. No, I was just going to add in there that um, Middlesex Group has had a chat with the digital company that's 
underpinning all the digital work in northwest London mm. that's starting to link up uh, all the information um, from secondary, tertiary, primary care. And we're trying to get community pharmacy into that as well, because everybody does seem to realise now, finally, that community pharmacy holds an awful lot of data that is important to other healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And we need to be on those digital platforms as well and sharing our data. Absolutely. Mike, Mike, you've got uh, your hand up. Mike. Okay, I think he's going to hold his water off. Okay, um, I see time has uh, crept up on us, and uh, I apologise for the lateness uh, in, our, in, our, in ending this meeting today. Uh, I hope there was food for thought for everybody there, uh, and I hope that we go away from this uh, particular webinar and having learned something, and we have, and then take that back into our particular practices and put that to good use. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank Georgia and Chris from uh, Healthy Member Partnerships. They have been absolutely wonderful in bringing this all together and making sure this webinar uh, is a success tonight. I want to thank my fellow uh, delegates, uh, Marsha, Darush and Bipin for giving up their evening and joining us for the webinar today. Um, just like to say that um, Marsha was absolutely right. Uh, community pharmacy provided a formidable response to COVID in the first wave. And working on Saturday locoming, I, I have a few trepidations because I think the second wave is coming and we are going to be flat out and having to deliver flu. But I think when the challenge is there, community pharmacy always rises to that challenge. And I also want to thank my colleagues in the other sectors because they have been absolutely supportive of community farms in the past few months. And especially in, in the pharmacy leadership cells where they've come together and been very supportive of community pharmacy. And I think that tripartite uh, coming together has been very good for our profession. And I really do want to move our profession forward and into helping patients and providing more clinical service. At the end of the day, community farms in London, there's uh, over 1800 pharmacies. It's a wonderful network available to patients within 20 minutes of walking distance and it's easy accessible and health watch says we're a trusted profession and commissioners really need to be tapping into that and using us more so that's all from me thank you very much for being here today and i hope you enjoyed the webinar i think chris has left her email there please feel free to email her with feedback on tonight's webinar it's most welcome thank you very much and good night good night